Matt questions about his air show career and uh, his life in aviation. Just uh, type them into the chat box and we'll save some time at the end to uh, answer those questions. So uh, just, just type them in. We'll compile them as we go along and uh, we'll uh, listen to what Matt has to say. So Matt, welcome to the, uh, to the program today. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. Appreciate it. Well, tell us a little bit about how you got started in aviation. Well, I grew up in aviation. I'm a third generation pilot. Uh, my grandpa and both of his brothers were pilots. Uh, my great uncles were naval aviators during World War II. And uh, anyway, my grandpa had a very successful career uh, designing and uh, developing autopilots as well as restoring antique airplanes. And then my dad was a renowned air show pilot. And so uh, aviation's all I've ever known and all I've ever wanted to know. And uh, early in your uh, career, before you took on full-size aircraft, you're also an RC enthusiast and, and still are today. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So Tell I've us enjoyed... a little bit about, about how you uh, got into the RC end and how that's translated into uh, your air show performance. Well, I built model airplanes as a kid, and I'm still building model airplanes today. It's uh, kind of something that you never grow out of if you, uh, if you have a passion for it. And the, uh, the neat thing about RC models is the, the uh, uh, stick and rudder movements are, are the, on the transmitter are the same as they are for a full-scale airplane. So it takes the same inputs to make the little airplane do what you want it to do as it does the big one that you sit in. And so a person can learn an awful lot about aviation by flying models. And it actually... I personally think it makes uh, learning to fly a full-scale airplane a lot easier because you're already that much further down the road than somebody that just walked in off the street and having never had any exposure to airplanes at all. Well, talk to us a little bit about some of the, the pictures we're seeing here on the on the screen. Looks like uh, you and your dad flying and, and you probably as a, as a young guy at uh, the controls as well. Yeah, that's... Uh, the one in the, in the middle there, um, I that's a picture that was taken of me when I was about my son's age. I'm not sure which Twin Beach that was in because Dad had several that I, as uh, we were growing up. But uh, anyway, I uh, never turned down the opportunity to go flying, ever. And uh, I spent a lot of time in the right seat of several Twin Beaches that Dad had over the years and uh, uh, became... Uh, very passionate about that airframe and everything about it at, at a very early age, much like my dad did and like my great uncle Bob did before him. So he actually, my, my uncle Bob actually taught multi-engine transition training in uh, uh, Navy JRBs and SMBs during the war. And so the, the Twin Beach goes way back in our family since way before I was ever in our family. And um, some of the other pictures there on the screen, Let's see, the one up in the uh, top left corner, that was taken in 2006 uh, in my grandfather's Travel Air Mystery Ship replica. And uh, next to that uh, is a picture of my dad after his first air show performance, which was here in Siloam Springs, Arkansas, when he was 18 years old. He's pictured there with his mother. And uh, after he passed away, I did my first air show performance in a decathlon very similar to the one that he used to fly. and. Uh, um, anyway, then that's that was taken in uh, 2005 in Fairview, Oklahoma, with my mother when I was 24 years old. So just kind of a fun recreation of uh, you know a unique event for both of us. And anyway, so I started flying air shows in the decathlon, and then uh, my grandfather let me his travel air mystery ship to book some shows with as well. Shortly thereafter, and. Uh, we did that for several years, introduced the Twin Beach in 2007, and the rest is history. But um, the, uh, the the picture over on the top right is, uh, was that was during a, a media ride at the Fayetteville Air Show in 2005 uh, in Dad's Learjet. And uh, I never missed an opportunity to ride co-pilot in that airplane and log the time because my a uh, long-term plan was always to become an airline pilot or some kind of a commercial pilot. Air shows wasn't really something I aspired to do. You know, just fate has a way of changing things. And uh, anyway, below that, 
is uh, my sister and I. That was taken at uh, in Midland at the CAF Air Show. I want to say that was probably 2007 or 8, sitting in my very favorite airplane in the entire world, which is a Grumman Hellcat. Ah. And uh, that was a, that was a really special evening getting the getting the cockpit tour. I'm sure Doug was on the other end of the camera there and showing me where the what all the switches did. And Amanda leaned in because she was curious too, and we got that great picture. So there you have it. There you go. So what was obviously you you were flying from a very young age, but when you got serious about uh, learning how to fly, what was the first aircraft that you were flying? I learned to fly in a Piper Cub, which is a fantastic airplane to, to learn in. Uh, you know, learning a tailwheel airplane uh, right out of the gate is kind of like uh, learning to drive a stick shift before you ever set foot in an automatic. You know, if you learn on the, the more difficult of the two, uh, then transitioning to a, a, con, a tri-geared airplane after you've learned, learned the basics in a tailwheel is much easier than going the other direction. So uh, I was very fortunate to learn how to fly in a Cub when I was 14. My uh, family friend taught me how to fly. And then uh, I was able to solo my grandfather's Travel Air 4000 biplane on my 16th birthday. Wow. That's a little bit of a transition from the, uh, from the uh, J3 to the biplane. It was. The Cub flew a lot better than the Travel Air did. And it was quite a bit warmer. You know, my birthday is January the 7th, and it was 19 ah. degrees outside when I sold that airplane and I had every piece of clothing that I could uh, possibly fit in on at the same time and it was still cold but uh, it was uh, it was a memory you know that I'll cherish for the rest of my life it really was an honor to get to do that so after you, you know, soloed what was the what was your progression uh, as far as aircraft went after that well I um, um, did the bulk of my training in the Cub. Uh, and then uh, my instructor also had a Cessna 150 that we did the, the night flying and the instrument stuff in. And I took my check ride in his 150. And uh, my next rating was the multi-engine rating, which I got in uh, Twin Comanche, which is uh, one of my favorite twins to fly to date. It's a fantastic airplane. And uh, then I progressed like everybody else generally does, you know, uh, commercial and multi-commercial, well, instrument, commercial, and then did a multi-instrument, multi-commercial check ride to round it out. And then many years later, I got my airline transport license. So anyway, it was, uh, like I said, aviation's all I've ever known. And what was it like uh, growing up? Obviously, uh, you're flying, uh, you're in your, your teen years, but you're also, I'm assuming, uh, going with your dad to air shows around the country as well. Oh, absolutely. I grew up in the air show industry, you know, from a very early age, uh, every opportunity we had to go to a show, uh, it was just, it was a wonderful way to grow up in aviation. Are there any memories that stand out from, uh, I mean, your dad did quite a few different acts throughout his uh, career. Uh, anything that stands out is, is really memorable? Well, everything he flew, he uh, flew to the the maximum capabilities of the aircraft. I mean, he was, uh, I would argue he was, uh, if not the best, one of the best air show performers that ever lived. And uh, incredible stick and rudder pilot. Uh, a lot of people remember, well, I mean, he flew seven or eight different acts and every one of them was memorable. My personal favorite was his uh, T6 demonstration. Uh, you know, and it's it was the, the first airplane that he ever really uh, air showed full time. And he started that demonstration with a snap roll on takeoff and did multiple slow rolls down the show line. Uh, hammerheads with snap rolls on the down line. Uh, he did a rolling 360 in it, a super slow roll. He did all kinds of things with that airplane that you don't see most T6 demonstrations uh, uh, replicating today. And uh, of all of the airplanes that he flew, that one was my very favorite to watch. But they were all interesting to watch. At what point did you uh, maybe put aside the airline career and think more about air shows as, as being a way that uh, you could make a living? 
Well, I, I started doing this because there was a financial, uh, a financial need uh, when my dad passed away to repay a lot of the deposits that he had taken in on the following season that he wasn't able to fulfill and that the family couldn't afford to pay back. And so, um, obviously I had, a, I had sentimental reasons for wanting to continue this, uh, heritage, but the, 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 uh, uh, broader reason was that uh, it was easier to fly off the deposits than it was to try to figure out another way to uh, make things right in that regard. And, uh, you know, dad and I went out in the decathlon a couple of times and worked on slow rolls uh, not very long before he passed away. And I never, I never could get it figured out. I never could get it right. And he got so frustrated with me and we'd come back and land earlier than we'd intended to. And, Anyway, after he passed away, um, I got in the decathlon and uh, was going to go out and, and mess around and try to work on my slow rolls again because we, uh, Amanda and Kyle and I had talked about uh, continuing this air show thing uh, for, for the reasons I laid out earlier. And it occurred to me that I didn't have a lot of leg room. You know, I'm four inches taller than my dad was. And I know for a fact that we never adjusted the seat in that airplane for my frame when we went out to do the slow rolls. And I reached down and uh, undid the seat lever and, and moved it back several inches. And all of a sudden my feet started working. So when I went out and started working on the slow rolls, uh, I was able to actuate the rudder in both directions, uh, you know, which you transition from one to the other and then back again when you're rolling an airplane on a line. And uh, anyway, uh, that was that was very gratifying, and with that uh, in my back pocket, I was able to take uh, the the slow rolls and the uh, skills that I had learned by flying model airplanes and taught myself aerobatics. And I did my first show in the decathlon in November of 2005. And uh, anyway, one thing led to another. Uh, my ultimate goal was to do a aerobatic demonstration in the Twin Beach. You know, it was. Uh, um, the, it was the most sentimental of all of the airplanes that dad flew. You know, my, uh, my parents' first date was to the Fayetteville airport to watch the twin beach mail plane start up and take off into the night. And shortly after they were married, uh, they moved to South Dakota. So dad could fly night air mail in a beach 18. And then when they moved back to Arkansas, he saved up and bought one of his own and, and flew on demand freight in that airplane until I was a teenager. So the Twin Beach, for a lot of reasons, was very sentimental for me to to try to hang on to and and bring back. And that was another thing. Any it became apparent that any airplanes that we had that we intended to keep were going to have to be able to pay their way, uh, or they were going to get you know get sold off rather rapidly. And so uh, I aspired to do that. Um, like I said, my grandfather lent me the keys to his traveler mystery ship and he saw my first demonstration in that. I only had about three weeks or so to practice because of a extensive annual and some bad weather we had uh, that year before I did my first show in it. And when I landed, he said that was the most graceful demonstration that he'd ever seen in an airplane and became went from being very pessimistic about me uh, trying to learn how to fly the twin beach upside down to being very supportive and uh, that support and encouragement on his part gave me the the courage to go ahead and put the time in and figure all this out and you know one thing led to another and it's just i i enjoy it i enjoy the uh, the camaraderie and the friends and i'm still a big kid at heart i love watching the warbirds fly by and love seeing the aerobatic demonstrations uh, just like I did when I was growing up. And uh, anyway, I'm still here doing this today. And how many different uh, Twin Beaches have, have gone through y your family to the uh, to Miss Ellie now? <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good question. I remember when my dad was, uh, uh, well, well, when I was a kid, we were eating at the local cafe and I asked my dad how many Twin Beaches he had flown. And he started counting and pretty soon he got his pen out of his pocket and pulled the napkin off the table and started writing down in numbers. And I want to say this was in the late eighties uh, when he compiled that list, he put at least 35 in numbers on that piece of paper. Oh my. I wish today I had that, 
that napkin so I could look up the airplanes and see where they ended up. But, uh, you know, he always had, uh, uh, dad's kind of, his MO seemed to always be, uh, he would start out flying an airplane, uh, you know, hauling freight or passengers with it. And then he'd get the crazy idea to put smoke on it and turn it upside down. So he did that with the Twin Beach. And uh, when the uh, freight market for Beach 18s dried up, he got into early model Lears and started doing the, you know, hauling small boxes very rapidly from point A to point, kind of a 135 operation. And he did that for a couple of years and thought, you know what, this is a great flying airplane. I'll bet it do a heck of an air show routine. So sure enough, he ended up with a Learjet and he, uh, you know, did, went down the same road with it. But I think I'm getting sidetracked here. Your, your question was about Twin Beaches. You know, the Twin Beach that, uh, that I'm flying now is the second one that he actually air showed. Uh, the blue and gray airplane was a, was a different airplane. And anyway, but it was kind of the airplane that put him on the map and made him a top tier performer and, you know, internationally renowned for what he was doing. So, um, as far as all of the airframes go, he, you know, he bought and sold a lot of airplanes, you know, bought them, uh, fixed them up a little bit and sold them and made some money on them. But, uh, he had one freighter in particular that he kept basically the whole time I was growing up. And, um, anyway, that's an interesting story we can get back to, but dad had 8,000 hours in this one airframe that, uh, like I said, he kept it. He sold it when I was a senior in high school. Tell us a little bit about the uh, the history of, of the airplane that you're flying now in the air shows. Well, the uh, the airplane I'm flying now was built in 1943. It was delivered to uh, the Army Air Corps at uh, Ellington Field, Houston, Texas, as an AT-7 navigation trainer uh, in November of 1943. Uh, it cost $59,795 to produce, which is, I think in today's dollars, that's around 900,000, somewhere in there. And uh, anyway, it was a navigation trainer uh, for the duration of the war after that. It was then transferred to the Department of Commerce, uh, which, uh, and the Civil Aeronautics Administration, uh, which eventually became the uh, FAA. So my airplane was actually an FAA flight check airplane that went around and, uh, you know, uh, tested instrument approach systems and all of that, all of that sort of thing. So it's kind of, it's also kind of gratifying in a way to take a former FAA airplane and turn it upside down. Cause that's something, you know, the FAA generally frowns on. So anyway, but it did that for many years. Uh, it was owned by a drop zone. It was owned by, uh, a couple of different corporate corporate outfits, and then eventually ended up at a maintenance school uh, where kids were taking it apart and putting it back together for college credit. And my dad picked it up in a boneyard in 2003, in, uh, or 2002, I guess it was, and had it mostly restored to the way uh, we still have it today. So what was the condition of the airplane when your dad picked it up? It was all there, but it had been sitting outside and neglected for very many years. And um, anyway, it was taken down. Um, they did, um, I mean, they did a, a fairly adequate restoration on it, but there was a lot uh, left to be gained or left to, that needed done when he brought it home. And uh, my crew chief, Jeff Gibbs, and I have actually continued to make the airplane nicer every year that, uh, that I've been flying it. Uh, we fixed an awful lot of things that uh, that should have been right before Dad ever ever flew it home from the restoration shop, and then uh, made a lot of significant upgrades to make the airplane safer to fly and make it last longer. So, so your um, I guess your your aim with uh, restoring refurbishing the airplane is not necessarily to bring it back to original condition, but a more of a um, safer, more modern aircraft? Well, yes and no. Uh, it's, it's really both. Uh, as far as the airplane's concerned, it, uh, I mean, it's, it's a stock C model twin beach. It's, uh, it, so all of the airplanes during World War II, all of the twin beaches, uh, left the factory just like mine still is. 
But after the war, most of them were remanufactured into D models where they put a, a heavier spar in them and uh, changed the incidence of the tail and lengthened the cells. They put stronger landing gear under them and just made a whole bunch of uh, modifications to them that would make them uh, be able to carry more uh, payload in the, in the back and uh, go faster and all of that. And luckily my airplane escaped that, uh, um, that reman. So my airplane, in comparison to all of the other twin beaches you see on the ramp, it looks just like all of the other ones, but mine flies like a great big cub and the rest of them fly more like a heavy twin engine transport. And so, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, that dates back to my great uncle. He took, uh, the very first airplane that the Department of the Navy uh, flew to Wichita to have remanufactured into a, a later version or a D model Twin Beach, if you will. He flew it to Wichita and left it there and went back six weeks or a couple of months later and picked that same airplane up and flew it back to Corpus Christi to the naval base he was stationed at. And he said they ruined it. He said it just, it never flew right after that. And so, um, you know, alongside my dad's desire to uh, do an aerobatic demonstration, you know, in a twin beach, which I'm sure he came up with in the middle of the night, sleep deprived. And uh, anyway, uh, my grandfather and his brother, Bob, um, ended up purchasing a sea model twin beach from a collector uh, that had recently passed away. They purchased it from his widow and brought it back to Arkansas. Uh, with the intent of having a, a a toy to play with, basically, you know, because it was like the airplanes that Bob taught him during the war. And uh, my grandfather was also interested in having something like that to horse around in. And one thing led to another. And my dad ended up with the keys to it. He actually brought it home from uh, uh, from Wisconsin, where it was, and said that it was lighter and faster than any other twin beach he'd ever flown. And between his crazy idea of doing an aerobatic demonstration that he never could sleep off. And the fact that, uh, you know, his dad and his uncle had purchased just the right airplane. One thing led to another and the, the uh, blue and uh, blue and gray airplane that you see on the screen is what resulted. As, as we're talking about the, the airplane and your aerobatic routine, you use the words uh, very graceful. Uh, and, and that's, I've heard people describe your, your routine as being very graceful, very, very uh, soothing even uh, to watch. It's just, it's just a pleasure to watch. How did you come up with the routine that you, that you fly at air shows? Well, thank you for the kind words. Uh, yeah, I really can't take credit for the routine. It's basically, uh, the same routine that my dad flew for, for many years. And, uh, I have modified a, a few things about it. Um, uh, just, just little stuff, you know, um, little stuff that nobody but me would ever really be able to tell the difference. So, and just to make it flow better, uh, the, you know, one thing that I, um, you know, the, the lights are a big addition, um, you know, which bodes well for the airplane both day and night. And the, the music selection for the routine is also, um, you know, part of the story, you know, you've got to have a good script and a good music to complement the flying. If, if one of those three pieces is missing, it just doesn't work. And dad's flying was exceptional, but he kind of missed the boat on the music end. And so that was one of the things that I, uh, uh that I tried to fix or tried to, uh, improve about the, about the routine, but the airplane, um, there's really not a way to fly twin beach. that's not graceful. You know, it simply doesn't, it won't let you do anything that is not graceful. So, and if you try, and if you try to do that, you know, you could overstress it or put yourself in a bad situation. So, um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the way the sequence flows, it's energy management and it works and it, it showcases what the airplane can do, but it also takes very good care of the airframe. So that's, uh, that's kind of the way we plan to make it work. Well, and that's, that's a very good point as well with, with some of the, um, more, uh, I guess you'd say sporty, uh, the monoplanes that do very, uh, tight, twisting motions and, and, and maneuvers and, and high G and negative and positive you really don't stress the airframe at all uh, on, on the twin beach and still, you know, present a wonderful performance that, 
that just enthralls people. Well, that's true. I, I appreciate that. Uh, no, the uh, uh, the airplane was designed uh, for 3.8 positive and 1.12 negative Gs at gross weight. And that was before they put the spar strap on it. And my routine never exceeds three Gs. You know, if, if, it, if it's ever over three Gs, it's because of the turbulence I was flying through to get the maneuver done. And I don't go negative at all. It's all basically, uh, it's a positive G show. Everything is done on a parabolic arc, you know, kind of like throwing a football. You know, it rises and falls. And, and uh, anyway, it just, it's a, a way to take care of the airplane and really showcase its capabilities to the max. And uh, I, I'll, you know, the Weisenheimers will come up and say something like, well, when are you going to show us, uh, you know, an outside tumble like the guy up there just did? And I said, this airplane's capable of, of doing anything once, you know, and we just kind of have to leave it at that. So <laughs> I do what I do with this and I'll leave the, that other stuff for them to do with their machines. There you go. How long did you practice uh, the, the uh, air shoe routine before you actually did it uh, for a public performance? Uh, quite, quite a bit. So, you know, dad and I never talked about what it took to do a twin beach routine. I mean, not even once that I can remember. I, I didn't have any idea what the entry speeds were, what the power settings were, uh, how much fuel and smoke oil he carried in which tanks on the airplane, uh, none of that. And, uh, Amanda actually had to call several shows that he had performed at the previous year and try to get their, uh, a fuel and smoke oil records to, you know, see um, when and how much he added uh, between performances and all that. And so uh, between that and, uh, uh, you know, using old um, air show tapes, you know, I had a, I'd put a tape in the VCR and use a stopwatch and basically start and stop a maneuver and time it. And then with the information that we had gathered by going to other to, to old air show venues about how the airplane weighed, um, I was able to use the that kind of data to basically recreate the routine. You know, lots of experimentation. Um, I actually, you know, I rolled the airplane quite a bit and it, and it was uh, astonishing to me how long it took to get around because I was used to flying the decathlon and it zips around compared to the Twin Beach. So that, that took a bit to get used to, and the point rolls were pretty straightforward. But uh, I, I, it took a long time to work up the nerve to actually pull this airplane over on its back. And it was with a lot of data that, that I did that. And I, I remember coming back from the Fayetteville Air Show in 2006. Um, we had, uh, it was Father's Day weekend, and it was the year after Dad passed. And I was able to put together an all twin beach missing man formation for him at the show that year. And after the show, I was flying back to Siloam Springs and I thought, well, I've been putting this off. I might as well give it a shot. So I climbed up high and ran everything forward and uh, got my airspeed and I pulled the airplane over on its back and did a loop and it actually worked. And so I did a half Cuban eight and it worked. So I did the other half and then I did another loop and then did a four point and an eight point roll just for good measure. And by the time I got, I did all of that stuff in one flight for the first time. And uh, when I got done, I was so excited. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to land the airplane. But uh, after that, you know, I, after I had proved to myself that I could safely do that, uh, then Amanda and I got to work about uh, trying to you know, take what you can do up high for fun and put it in an aerobatic box down close to the ground and choreograph all of the uh, the narration and the music and all of that stuff that it took to make that debut at Sun and Fun in 2007 a reality. You touched on something that I actually hadn't thought of before, but uh, what is sort of the balance of, of fuel in all those tanks that are, that are in the airplane? How do you, I mean, it, you must have to calibrate everything before you start uh, rolling and looping. Well, it's uh, it's not as complicated as it sounds. My uh, my airplane still has the single fuel selector in it that all of the World War II era airplanes did. So, um, you know, both engines feed off the same tank all the time. So, you know, my joke is if you run a tank dry, it gets quiet enough, you can hear the people in the back scream. 
So during an air show performance, uh, I use the, I fill the uh, rear ox tanks with the smoke oil and I keep the bulk of my fuel in the right main tank. That's the tank I run off the show. Cause I figure if the, if the majority of the fuel weights in the right tank, it offsets the fat guy sitting in the left seat, you know, and I don't know how accurate that is, but it's my theory. And then uh, just in case I have any kind of a fuel, uh, uh, fuel flow issue from that tank. I carry enough. Uh, I carry enough fuel in the left tank to, you know, get the airplane back safely without any issues. But but no more than that. Okay. So the idea is to keep it as light as possible, but you know, still have a good safety reserve for what you need. Good. Uh, what other modifications have you made to the airplane for the air shows? You mentioned the smoke oil uh, or smoke system, obviously, and the uh, the lights. Any anything else? No, there's really not. It's um, the, uh, you know, it's been lightened up as best we could. There's no insulation in the airplane. There's no, there are no creature comforts in the airplane at all. So it is as, uh, it's as light an airframe as you can possibly make a twin beach and still have it fly right. Uh, we beefed up the cowlings. Uh, my airplane tends to go faster than most of the other twin beaches out there when I'm building the energy to pull it over on its back. And that has caused some uh, stress issues with the way the cowlings mount the airplane. So uh, we've strengthened the cowlings in several different ways to you know, get longer life out of them. Uh, all of the other modifications we've made are just in the name of safety. Um, I've got a set of Cleveland wheels and brakes on it, which is uh, two generations better than the brakes that it left the factory with. And um, I've got a, you know, a WASP capable GPS and an autopilot, so we can actually file instruments and go somewhere and shoot an approach to get in if we need to. Um, and the rest of it is just, like I said, it's a it's a bone stock airplane. It is, I could argue that this airplane is more original than any other one out there because again, it escaped the the remanufacturer that all of the other airplanes had. You know, uh, I think the CAF, if I remember right, has ten. Twin beaches in their inventory, and uh, all but one of them are D models, like I talked about. I think they have an E model, which is an even later version. So, um, anyway, this airplane's a little bit different. Yeah. What about the uh, light, the light system? How did that that come to be, both for well, day and night? Um. Well, the thing was the. Yeah, I was joking with Jeff one day. I said, you know, if if this if all the lights this airplane had on it when it left the factory, if they all worked, you know, we'd be well on our way to a night show. And then uh, it got more and more serious. And I've always thought night shows were fascinating. I remember going to see them when I was a kid and seeing, uh, you know, Gene Soucy and Bill Leff and uh, uh, Steve Oliver go out there and put pyrotechnics on their airplanes and fly them after dark. And just how cool was that? And uh, I thought, well, you know, I've got with this great big airplane, I think we could do it all with lights. I don't think we need pyrotechnics. And, you know, I thought, well, if, uh, how to contrast it. So we we designed the setup so that the top of the airplane actually you can see the silhouette of it. You know, we've got lights in the windows that shine out on the wings and we've got lights uh, uh, on the top where the original beacon used to be that light the top of the tail up. But the bottom of it twinkles. All of our strobes and uh, all of that stuff um, is on the bottom of the airplane, and that's that's uh, was done uh, twofold for one for safety because I don't need to be looking at flashing lights when I'm flying the airplane, and two it gives you a contrast. So if the top and the bottom are lit differently, you can tell which way it's oriented when it's doing the maneuvers after dark. And uh, I mean, I even I even reinstalled the uh, uh, IFF lights underneath, you know, the color of the daylights, if you will, the red, green, and amber that all of the, all of the warbirds had back in the day. And, uh, you know, they're, they're lit up as bright as we can make them at night, along with so many other things. And um, every idea I had for lights, Jeff was able to make a reality. I mean, there was never anything too crazy that he couldn't figure out a way to get it done. And, um, uh, you know, we added the engine lights to kind of light up the inside of the nacelles because, you know, a radial engine's a work of art anyway to look at. And if you could see it as it's flying by at night, I mean, how cool would that be? So we did that. 
uh, our most recent upgrade was to actually add colored lights for the smoke. So I have, uh, I can either light the smoke uh, naturally white the way it is, or we I've got red spotlights I can put on it to make it appear that the smoke coming out of the airplane is red. And it just adds to the choreography of the of the night show, you know, and complements the the music and all of that stuff, you know, much the way I'd mentioned earlier. It's just uh, it works great. And uh, uh, doing the night flying itself, I, it, that's actually my favorite part of air show in the airplane. It's uh, doing a night performance is much more challenging for a lot of reasons, and the challenge is what makes it so much fun. Well, describe some of those challenges, obviously, aside from the lack of daylight and being able to see the ground and other references, what other challenges uh, play into the night show? Well, um, part of that was, uh, you know, what you just touched on, you know, sometimes, luckily, the, luckily, uh, night shows, uh, the weather is either absolutely perfect or so bad that they cancel the show. There's very, very rarely any in between. So when the moon and the stars are out, it's uh, it's really nice, and you can define a, a horizon pretty reasonably with that. But when it's a darker night, there's no moon, or it's a little bit hazy, or something along those lines, you actually have to use street lights and uh, um, other, um, if you will, you know, other. Um, oh, I'm at a loss for words here. Basically, the lighting of the city, you know, find a road or a, that's a road with cars passing on it or use the city skyline as your horizon. And, um, you know, that can be in different uh, uh, different frames of reference, depending on which maneuver you're doing. So uh, that can be challenging, you know, doing a show out in the mountains where the, the lights that you might be using uh, for your horizon are all over the hillside up and down. You know, that kind of makes it challenging. You you know, and the routine has to be modified accordingly to make that work. Uh, the other thing is, uh, like I mentioned, the, the choreography is also part of the fun challenge. I've got 23 toggle switches and a rotary dial that I use to control all of these lights on this airplane. And different combinations of those switches give you different visual effects uh, for each pass. And I try to I try to make the airplane appear slightly different every time it comes back by the crowd. And so the idea is, you know, take off. Dad always said, take off, do what you're good at once and land. And so the night show was designed with that in mind. Keep it short and sweet. And when I've run out of switches to turn on, uh, then the, the music soundtrack quits. The airplane disappears and we're done. And hopefully we're done before everybody was ready for us to be done instead of being the other way around. <laughs> well, that is true. I, I, I just have to interject a, the personal experience uh, watching you at the Midland Air Show a number of years ago, uh, there was a thunderstorm south of the field by about 60 miles. It was lighting up the clouds, probably up to 40, 50,000 feet. And you departed the, uh, the air show box as you normally do, shut off all the lights in the airplane and the thunderstorm lit up the sky. <laughs> so to this day, I still want to know which one of those switches is the one that you threw to, to make the lightning go. Well, you know, it's hard to say. I I, uh, I was fortunate enough to do that a couple of years ago at Oshkosh during the Wednesday night show. You know, I figured that the routine was getting a little bit monotonous. So uh, to liven things up, I brought a real life thunderstorm over the airport <laughs> to bring out the rest of the show. And uh, anyway, now I remember I pulled up to do the do the loop. And I looked out the window and the lights were flashing off of the very large raindrops that were coming down. And uh, I popped out of the top of the loop and I'm looking the other direction and it's beautiful starlit sky. There's not a cloud anywhere around. And then turned the corner and flew right back into the rain. And then, uh, you know, reset and did a turnaround and I was doing the pass to the other direction and, you know, basically flew to the dry end of the airport. And that's when they called the show off and, you know, we landed. So the worst part of that experience was my storm window actually leaked quite a bit. So I landed in perfectly clear VFR conditions on the south end of the airport and then had to taxi back into the thunderstorm to get to the hangar, which was clear on the north end of the airport. So by the time I got there, my flight suit from the chest this way was completely soaked from all the water that was coming in through that window. 
one of uh, many uh, memorable experiences I'm sure you've had throughout the years. Yes, sir. It's been a it's been a lot of fun, and uh, I've made a lot of really really fun, interesting memories as a result. Well, along with flying the uh, the day show and the night show, you also uh, toss jumpers out the back of the airplane from time to time. I do. That's uh, yeah. I, yeah from, let me clarify what I said earlier. Um, you know, the day show compared to the night show, I enjoy the night show more because of the challenges I laid out. But my favorite thing ever to do at a show is drop jumpers. And I've been fortunate enough to drop the uh, uh, U.S. Army Black Daggers, you know, Special Forces Parachute Team that's pictured here dozens and dozens of times. And most of those guys have become really good friends. And we've, I think we've dropped every significant uh, parachute team in the country on several occasions now. And most of them love the Twin Beach. They don't like the fact that the door's small and kind of hard to get out of, but they enjoy the ride up. They know it's predictable. They know that uh, the pilot up front knows what he's doing, you know, and it's uh, it's worked out very well. You know, most of the, you know, from a, a skydiving standpoint, if you show up at a show, uh, God knows what kind of wore out 182 they're going to have show up to that you're going to have to get out of. And, you know, the kid building time may or may not have thrown jumpers uh, very much before at all. So um, when the when the uh, parachuting teams have an opportunity to jump out of our airplane, it brings a stress level down for them. And it's uh, like I said, we enjoy doing it. And it's also pretty cool to, you know, you've seen the uh, you know, the little airplane circle, the, the flag down with smoke, you know, for the national anthem. Well, how cool is it that I can throw all of the passengers out and pull the gear and the flaps up, turn the smoke on and just roll in and chase them down. You know, it's interesting to see the jump plane actually chase the jumpers down with smoke. And, uh, sometimes if we time it just right, uh, when the flag is coming into land, we'll be doing a banana pass right behind them as the, as the flag touches and the anthem concludes, uh, there's the jump plane right behind them. And then we pitch up and come around and land and get reset for the next event. But uh, like I said, it's it's a lot of fun, it really is. Are there any unique challenges that go with uh, carrying the jumpers? Well, uh, you know, the, the more weight you carry, the harder it is to get to altitude. So obviously when we're doing a jump run, we want to have uh, you know, not minimum fuel per se, but uh, not a whole lot more than we need and minimum smoke oil. So, uh, you know, smoke oil is heavy. There's no reason to carry all that to altitude and back when you don't need it for that flight, you need it for the next one. So we plan accordingly. Um, also, I have to stack the jumpers as far forward in the airplane as I can for CG purposes. And, uh, you know, we're really limited on the amount of weight we can carry. You know, I used to advertise that we could carry eight jumpers, but what that has really translated into is uh, 10 very petite, beautiful women or six combat ready Marines. So anyway, it, um, you know, that's, that's one of the challenges. Uh, luckily, the, you have to have a certain license to be able to uh, jump into an air show site into wavered airspace. So the people that, uh, that do fly with us are professionals and there's a, uh, the amount of, uh, professional courtesy that goes along with that is, uh, is mutual and it works out really well for all of us. I tell guys, you know, treat my airplane as an elevator, not a jungle gym, you know, get in it, get out of it. Don't hang on. Don't wait for your buddy. Just go. And so far they all have, they know what to expect from me and I know what to expect from them. And anyway, it, it works. It works great. And of course, uh, you've also, uh, had opportunity to fly with some, uh, some other well-known performers, including here at the Blue Angels. Absolutely. I've had a wonderful opportunity to do photo shoots with most of the uh, major players in the industry. And, uh, you know, be the photo ship a lot of times. And uh, it's, uh, I can't tell you what an honor it is when the Blue Angels trust you enough and uh, uh, the uh, photographer in the airplane that you're following to line up on you. They know you're not going to do something silly that's going to have them you know, it's going to jeopardize their safety in any way. And, you know, for them to, you know, trust us enough to actually 
create a picture like the one you're looking at now. It's it's a real honor. It really is. Not to put you on the spot, but as you're at an air show somewhere in the country, who or maybe a couple of the who's are the the pilots that you just have to stop and watch their routine? Oh, shoot. Uh, Aeroshell. Aeroshell, the Aeroshell aerobatic team, I, I hardly ever miss a performance of theirs. Those guys are heroes of mine. And uh, anyway, they're just incredible to watch. And, you know, when they do a night show, the rest of us ought to just not even bother because there's no way to follow that. You know, four T6s that are all lit up and it's just incredible to watch. Um, I don't know. I've, I've got so many heroes and friends. Uh, you know, Rob Holland is a good friend of mine, and what he makes his airplane do stuff that airplanes aren't supposed to do ever. And then he gets bored with that and goes and invents something else. And he has invented more maneuvers than I think anybody in our industry in a hundred years. And uh, you know, Skip Stewart, and uh, just on and on and on. I, I I love watching Gene Susie fly his Ag Cat. I love watching. Uh, uh, so many of our performers fly the high performance biplanes and monoplanes. And, uh, you know, what Bob Carlton does with a sailplane is incredible. And Manford Radius. I mean, how much time do we have? I could go, I've got, I've got a hundred acts that I, that I try not to miss, you know, when that, when they fly, cause they're just incredible to watch. So you're, you're telling us you're really in not only an airshow performer, but an airshow fan. Oh, absolutely. You know, everything Greg Shelton has ever flown has intrigued me. You know, he just, he's another one of those performers that flies multiple airplanes and he gets every last ounce of uh, payoff out of them. And, uh, you know, it just goes on and on. Well, good. At the uh, outset, we mentioned that uh, not only you're an air show performer, but also uh, a CAF member. And this is an airplane that you have spent some time in as well, Fifi, the B-29. Yes, sir. That is an airplane I'm, I have been very fond of since I was a little kid. And I remember um, when I was growing up, I had a book in my room that had B-29s in it. I'd never seen one in person, didn't know if any of them even still existed. And I was reading through this book and looking at all the pictures. And I asked my dad about it. I said, are there any B-29s still out there? And he says, yeah, there's a bunch of them in museums. I said, well, I'd sure love to see one someday. Any of them fly? Said, yeah, there's one that flies. Um, and he, we talked about that. And it wasn't a month later that Fifi came to Rogers, Arkansas. And I remember sitting in the back of the family suburban when we topped the hill and saw that airplane sitting on the ramp. And it was the biggest airplane I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, it was just daunting how huge it was to a five or six year old kid. And anyway, um, we went out and uh, got the cockpit to her. I thought, I thought my dad was really cool. He must have known some people to, you know, to let us up in the cockpit so we could actually see where the, the controls were of this airplane, you know, because they don't just let anybody up there. But uh, I remember that the tire, the, the main tire was much taller than I was the first time I saw the airplane. And it's just been fascinating to me ever since. And many years later, uh, when I was extended the opportunity to actually be part of the crew on that airplane, uh, that's an honor I can't even put into words. And uh, every time I'm around it, I'm just inspired by it. And, uh, the, you know, the story that it tells and the the memories that it brings out of people like the the fellow I'm pictured with here uh, are incredible. If I remember right, that, that guy was a central fire control officer uh, that sat in the on the stool in the back and looked out of the, the uh, top blister and controlled all of the weapons on the airplane with his uh, aiming device. And he had not been in a B-29 uh, since he was in a B-29 over Japan doing it for real back during World War II. And I was part of the crew that got to take him flying. We had him and we had a Korean era flight engineer that were both on board the airplane. And I remember we were flying, Brad Pilgrim was engineering and uh, this guy, the engineer, the, the uh, Korean era guy was sitting in the uh, flight observer seat right across the aisle from him and just watching Brad like a hawk. And we got done and uh, we're debriefing and Brad looks over and says, well, how'd I do? 
And that guy said, well, there's a few things I would have done differently, but I reckon you'll pass. <laughs> and just, you know, the, the experience is obviously flying the airplane is a dream come true, but the, everything that goes with flying that airplane uh, just, you know, it just gives me goosebumps. It's awe-inspiring in so many ways. Do you get to fly the airplane uh, much? I mean, between your air show uh, you know, <laughs> tour and the tour of the uh, of the B twenty nine, they hopefully they coincide sometimes. They do. Some I've been fortunate enough to fly it at air shows before. Um, it, it's uh, that's been great when that works out. Um, it's been a couple of years since I've really had any opportunity to tour with the airplane because uh, my air show schedule got pretty busy and it did not coincide with uh, Fifi's tour schedule. And then, of course, this last year was a mess for everybody. So anyway, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to getting back in that airplane this year. Um, you know, I was extended an invitation to go back to ground school and um, hoping to put my name on the schedule a time or two and and uh, and get back in the seat because I miss it a lot. It's like I said, it's just incredible to fly. Well, what other uh, warbirds have you flown aside from the, the Twin Beach and the B-29? Um, I've flown a B-17, a B-25. I got to steer an A-26 around a little bit, but I can't really count that as a flight because there wasn't an unassisted takeoff and landing involved. Uh, I got to fly a Mustang. That was really neat. Um, and I think that's, uh, I've flown a T-6 quite a bit, flown a Stearman, you know, um, a lot of the little stuff, but that pretty well rounds it out for me. Um, I'm intending to expand that list at some point, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully all that will work out as well, too. Oh, good. That's a pretty impressive list already. Uh, what, what might be on your, your bucket list? The number one thing on my bucket list as it pertains to aviation is to fly a Grumman Hellcat. Mm. That has been my favorite airplane since I was a very small child. Uh, you know, when all the other kids were out playing football and baseball, um, I was building model airplanes and watching Midway and Tora 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 and Flying Leathernecks and 12 O'Clock High and all of those movies on the TV. You know, when it was raining outside, especially, and then when the sun was shining, I'd take my collection of World War II models that I'd build out in the front yard and I'd have my own battle. And so I've been a Warbird fan uh, for many, many years, but... Uh, if I ever had the opportunity to fly a Grumman Hellcat, I've, I've told my whole family this, I could hang up my aviation career and never look back because it is just the end all do all for me. Oh, that's great. And uh, well, hopefully that uh, will be something you'll, you'll get to do in the future. There's still a few out there, right? Yeah, I certainly hope so. And well, uh, I've been keeping track of all of them and where they go and <laughs> where they've ended up. So maybe one of these days. Well, let's take a look at some of the uh, the questions that, that folks have uh, typed in here tonight. Um, uh, Hawk Moore is wondering, what military aircraft do your relatives fly? Uh, my my Uncle Bob did, um, uh, he taught basic aerobatics and, uh, or well, basic uh, flight training, primary flight training, if you will, uh, in a Boeing Stearman. And he also, um, you know, did the Twin Beach transition training I was telling you about. And that was during the war. He also flew PBYs and PV2s on submarine patrol off of the coast, you know, looking for Japanese submarines that, that, that everybody suspected were going to hit the mainland here. And uh, anyway, he, he did that quite a bit. Um, after the war, he flew uh, DC-4s or C-54s. He flew Constellations and Lodestars and all that for the, uh, uh, for the reserve. And he spent the first half of his post-Navy career taking stock Stearmans and turning them into ag airplanes and spraying crops with them. He spent the second half of his career turning ag Stearmans back into stock Stearmans and selling them to collectors. <laughs> And he had he had uh, three different FM2 Wildcats. He had a T28 um, and a whole host of T6s and T34s and other airplanes. I mean, he was big into the the military stuff his his whole career. 
and uh, uh, my his brother Bill, uh, my grandfather's other brother, flew Dauntlesses and TBMs off of aircraft carriers. He never actually got deployed and went to war, but he because he was, but he had fulfilled his training and was uh, ready to ship out when the war ended. So after the war, he 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 uh, got a. He founded a business called Yunkin and Sons where he did front end alignment and automotive repair work and just never really, never really looked back at airplanes. That wasn't, uh, wasn't something that interested him, but Bob and then my grandfather, Jim made a career out of it and as did my father and as have I. Uh, we, you mentioned the, uh, modifications to the nacelles on the, on the beach 18, any other, uh, modifications that have been made to the engines, uh, for the air shows? Not at all. They are bone stock. Uh, they are they're ten to one, like uh, Pratt and Whitney designed them back in the 1920s. Um, I've got pressure carbs, but they're still uh, it's, they're called pressure carbs, but they're basically still a gravity fed system. If you roll this thing upside down and push just even slightly, the engine quits instantly, and uh, you know which is also part of the reason I don't do that. You know, if they both quit, you're just a big glider. But if one of them quits and the other one's still running, sometimes that can be a problem. So just stay away from that area. But um, I run, you know, 36 inches on takeoff and usually 34 or 35 for the rest of the performance. Uh, we've turned the props up to a little over 20, 2,400 RPM. Uh, the uh, Tulsa Aircraft Engines, who, you know, maintains our engines and takes such good care of our airplane. Um, they said that, you know, engines don't like, these engines don't like manifold pressure, but they don't mind RPM. So um, we spin them a little faster to, to get the noise out there, but, uh, you know, never, ever over boost them. All right. What's the uh, inspiration for the colors uh, on, on Miss Ellie? Well, the, uh, it goes back to the Travel Air Mystery Ship. Uh, my grandpa's first uh, replica that he built was the Travel Air Mystery Ship, and it left the factory in 1929 uh, when it won the National Air Races in Cleveland in those colors. And so when grandpa built his replica, he painted it accordingly. And a few years later, he built, uh, he converted a tri-pacer into a piper pacer and did a whole bunch of, of speed mods to it and extended tanks and all that. And he painted it like his mystery ship. And then many years later, he built a Molly Coop, uh, an, another airplane he designed and scratch built and painted it just like the mystery ship. And so all of grandpa's airplanes ended up red with black scallops. And my dad decided that that was a pretty, uh, you know, a pretty catchy paint scheme. So he uh, incorporated it into uh, the airplanes he was flying as well. So. Uh, for the last many years, most of the air show airplanes that we've had have been red and black for that reason. Good. Uh, in a busy air show year, about how many miles do you fly? Oh, that's a challenge. <laughs> You're going to make me do math. I'll tell you this. The airplane, uh, we fly the airplane between 150 and 200 hours a year. So 200, let's see. I don't know. What would that be? At 40,000 miles a year. Is that is my math right? If the airplane goes 200 miles an hour and we're flying at 200 hours a year, is that 40,000 miles? It sounds good to me. I sure. I lost you when I had to take off my shoes. We, we, fly, we fly coast to coast. I've done shows in Canada and I've flown in the Caribbean. I've flown as far south as Panama. So it just depends on, on the year, um, you know, where we're going and how far we have to go. I know on a good year, we're changing the oil every two or three weeks. So it's uh, a lot of traveling. Good. Um, and I guess this question is probably going to echo the, the one about your favorite air show performer, but do you have any uh, favorite shows that you enjoy uh, coming back to? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, Oshkosh is always a favorite because it's uh, it's it was a family vacation for me growing up. And it's in, it's great to be able to take my family up there and it's a busy week, you know, with all the flying and the sponsor stuff that we do and all that. But in the evenings to be able to relax around the campfire with my family and friends, is just, there's nothing like it. 
Uh, my favorite military venue I've ever performed at was off an Air Force Base. Um, there's just something about the home of the Strategic Air Command and the, you know, the layout of the base itself and the folks that, that are typically there. Most of them are really good friends of mine. And uh, it's just, you know, it's by far my favorite Air Force Base I've ever flown. Uh, there's so many others, uh, you know, Louisville, Kentucky, you know, Thunder Over Louisville is another one uh, that I've been fortunate enough to fly uh, for several years now. That's always a favorite. And uh, Midland was a favorite back in the day when it's been a long time since I've flown down there. I'm hoping to get back there at some point, but I really enjoyed that. So um, I don't know. It's too many favorites to mention. There you go. Uh, just about out of time. We want to thank everyone for uh, typing in their questions and uh, listening along this evening. But Matt, any any final thoughts before we sign off? Well, one thing I was going to tell you guys about uh, that Twin Beach that I told you earlier that my dad had 8,000 hours in that I grew up riding around in, I was a recently able to reacquire. And I'm really excited about that. Um, it's... Uh, that's it. That's the one pictured there. So it hadn't flown in 15 years. So it's going to take quite a bit of work, uh, quite a ways from home to get it ferryable to get it back to Arkansas. But I'm hoping once we get it here and I can uh, make it nice again to be able to do some really neat stuff with it. You know, it'll never be an air show airplane, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, doing multi engine training and uh, twin beach checkouts, dinner flights, going to look at Christmas lights dropping jumpers. I mean, I've got half a dozen ideas for how to make that airplane and hope at least hopefully offset some of the costs of owning it. But uh, I'm really, really excited to get it home. And don't be surprised if uh, if you guys see me dropping jumpers out of that one at an air show someday instead of the red and black one that you're used to. All right. We'll look forward to it, Matt. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. We know 2021 hopefully is going to sh shape up to be a good year for uh, air shows again. And uh, we uh, hope to see you out on the flight line somewhere along the line this year. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Matt Yonkin has been our guest uh, tonight, and we'll uh, sign off now and uh, hope that you will join us again next Wednesday night for another CAF Warbird Tube webinar. I'm Steve Buss. Have a good evening.